we're still first in the Mountain West in the standings. And we just came off a loss, and we felt like we had to have a player meeting and, you know, just get more connected. And then after that, you know, sky was the limit for us. And, uh, you know, winning regular season title, winning the conference title, uh, we knew that we could be really, really dangerous coming to the tournament. Nathan. Yeah, for me, the reason why I said that 90, like, you, you're kind of happy with something that you're good at, like, as a person. So when I first got there, I, I picked uh, some of the principles that the older guys were sharing. And I really excelled in defensively, like my early uh, stages of college. So I kind of like fell in love with it. And as Coach Dutch always says, if you play defense, if you're a freshman and you play defense, you're going to be on the floor. And I wanted to be on the floor, so I, I made sure I excelled in that point. Yeah. We'd like to thank Lamont, Nathan, and Adam for joining us here in the main interview room. Thank you, fellas. Thanks, guys. We'll thank see you, guys. Some of you guys tomorrow. Yes, sir. Thank you. Head coach Brian Dutcher is coming up in just a moment. We're joined now by the head coach of the Aztecs, Brian Dutcher. Coach, we'll ask you to begin with an opening statement, then we'll take some questions. Just spent some quality time with Dusty May, and it's no surprise that uh, he has the team he has. They're well coached. They reflect their head coach, and we're excited for our opportunity to play them, and uh, I'm expecting a really, really good game. Coach, we're going to take some questions. We're going to start right in the center of the room. Let's get a microphone over to John Fanta. Brian, John Fanta with Fox Sports. Uh, we just talked with your guys, and Nathan Mensa said our first San Diego State practice, his first as a, as a freshman, it, he's like, look, we did 10 minutes of defense before the seniors even arrived, and then we did 90 minutes more defense, and he was thinking, okay, when is this going to change? How would you reflect on on how you kind of introduce your players to everything that this program is about and what that process entails to get them bought in? It starts when you recruit them. It can't start when they show up on campus. When we recruit them, we tell them, uh, we defend at a high level here. If you don't want to play defense, we're not the place for you. But if you do, if you do defend, we'll let you play with great freedom offensively. And that's kind of what we are. So when they get there and they're not having success, even though they're scoring, it's like, hey, we told you, we're defense first. And you have to defend in order to earn an opportunity to play offense. And so it's a culture. It's something we've always preached, and I think we're pretty good at it. Continuing with questions for Coach Dutcher. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We can go all the way to the back of the room. This is the back right microphone for Aaron. Uh, Coach Dutch, Aaron Torres, Fox Sports. You know, I remember meeting with you your first year on the job, 2018 or so, and even then you were talking about let's get old, let's stay old. And I just, like, when did that become the San Diego State thing? And then obviously you guys have been able to take it to an extreme with the, uh, you know, with the COVID waiver, but how have has it been a convincing process to get all these guys to use this extra year? Do they want to be there? Because, like I said, it just feels like it's been your mantra for this program really from the beginning. Yeah, I mean – our culture is set by our four-year guys and five-year guys, guys that come in as freshmen. And so we have guys that invest a lot, and they spend their four and five years in our program. But then we also take transfers. And so in the early transfer years, when they had a city year, that would automatically make you older because now they've sat a full year and they're getting to their fifth year. And so now that the culture has changed a little bit with uh, the portal and instant eligibility, we've found a way to maintain our, our age and our experience level. And that's not to say if you're a really good freshman, you can't play for us. I mean, Nathan Mentz is a four-year starter. Uh, Matt Mitchell, we had him, four-year starter. So we get four-year starters, but to uh, be a freshman and play at our place, you have to be very good. 
Coach, we're going to move to the right side of the room. Chris? Hey, Coach. Chris Button with ESPN. I'm wondering for 2020, when you guys built this incredible team and, and had a great run and then the tournament's canceled, how did you process that? You've been at this university for so long. You get them to this point and maybe reassuring yourself it's going to happen again down the line. How did you process that mentally? From the day we stepped on campus, Coach Fisher and I, all those years ago, we believed this was a possibility. And we sold it recruiting. We didn't just say it wasn't empty words just to get a kid to come. We believed if we did what we were supposed to do, uh, we could make a Final Four, we could win a national championship. And so uh, that's what the message is. We believed it could happen. That's our culture. And, and some people might say it was a fantasy, but obviously we're sitting here today. On the right side to the right of the aisle. Matt Musil with uh, KHOU 11 CBS here in Houston. Ryan, Jaden Ledee shows up in Houston, a kid out of the Kincaid School. A lot have been made about University of Texas maybe being here, maybe University of Houston being here, but he's here. Uh, tell me about Jaden, and uh, he took a circuitous route to get to San Diego State and get to the Final Four, but give me some insight on Jaden. Before the season started, anybody asked me how you're going to be this year, and I said we're going to be really good. And I said that because of Jaden Ledee. I had watched him. He wanted to sit a year. He wanted to sit out year. And I watched him in practice every day, how dominant he was. And I just felt he was the missing piece to us being really, really good. Now, we had experienced players coming back. But Jaden at the start, I always said, and I said this to Jaden, he sat a year and so he's so anxious. And sometimes the more you want something, you squeeze it so hard it slips through your fingers. Now he's starting to settle in. He's starting to get comfortable. And I will say this, Jaden has another level to go. Of all our guys, Jaden has another level to go. So hopefully that level happens here this next two days. But he is a magnificent player that knows how to play, and he's only scratching what he's able to do on the basketball court right now. Coach, we're going to move to the left side of the room. Billy? Billy Witz with the New York Times. Brian, the NCAA said that they're going to tighten up uh, the rules regarding uh, transferring and not, not give out waivers. Uh, for the second transfer so readily. How are you guys um, just, I mean, I know you're occupied with these games here, but just how, how are you approaching that? And I mean, when you're looking at, at guys that it would be a second transfer, what are those conversations like? Well, the only second year transfers we're looking at are the ones that graduate and are eligible next year, you know? And I was on the phone I'm getting ready for the game, but I made a recruiting call on the way over here from the bus because uh, while we're sitting here uh, getting ready for the greatest event in the world, there are coaches doing home visits and recruiting for next year's team. So as focused I am now, i am also got one eye on the future. If you don't do that, you shouldn't be coaching. Billy, can you pass the mic to John in the middle? All right, we're going to bring a mic to John. That's the back left mic. John. Uh, Brian. Over the last six years, this program has gone 107 wins to just 22 losses. Like you've, you've been so consistently strong, and you've talked about why that is. Can you reflect on what the process is to, to all of us and maybe to the, the, the national people that cover the sport of, of what it means when you're winning a lot of games, but now you're winning a lot of games and you're doing it in college basketball's biggest stage and you're standing in a Final Four? Yeah, I mean, we've had good teams, but it's hard to win in March. We all know that. I mean, if we were to say all the best teams with the best season should be here, they're not here right now. The teams that are playing the best are here. And so even though we lost a first-round game to Houston with Calvin Sampson, my first NCAA tournament game, we had a good team, one-possession game. Uh, we lost last year to Creighton in overtime. We had a good team, but it's hard to win in March. So sometimes matchups, playing your best basketball. So uh, I don't want to lose sight that this team is more special than the others. This team has won games in March, but these other teams we've had are really good too. It's just hard to win games in March. Follow-up question for John. Just to, just to follow, like you didn't wake up and drink something different for breakfast or, have, or to change your lifestyle for, for that to happen, right? I mean, it's just a matter of continuing to be in the tournament. Yeah, well, I think the one thing that anybody who's followed Aztec basketball knows this, and no matter what kind of team we've had and where we finish, we get better as the year goes on. 
And that's just our culture. It's if you think you're good enough now and you, you can't get any better, don't get off the bus. We have another level to go. And even today, the message was, if you don't think we can get better at practice today, then don't practice. We can get better every time we step on the floor. And if you deliver that message and they believe in it, they'll get better as the season goes on. So as good as we play or as bad as we play, we're going to get better as the season goes on. And that's part of our culture. And you don't do it. You know, I learned from Coach Fish a long time ago. Everyone asks, well, you were really patient as an assistant coach waiting for your opportunity. It's because I always felt like I was contributing. If you get good people, you let them work. You delegate. So as much as Coach Fisher was winning because they were his teams, I felt like they're not winning unless I'm doing what I do. And my assistant coach is the same way. Dave Velasquez, Chris Hacker, J.D. Lester, J.D. Pollock, uh, Sam Scholl, they all feel like they're contributing to the success. They all feel like I'm the reason we're winning. I want them to feel that way. And so you don't, you don't win unless you have good coaches. You don't win unless you have good players that believe they can get better. So uh, – People talk about culture, they're in a, they're their third year into a head coach at a program. Culture is 24 years in one place. And that's where I've been. That's culture. Coach, we're going to move up front to the left. Adam? Coach Adam Zagoria, New York Times. Um, you talked about getting old, staying old. I think this is the fourth Final Four with no McDonald's All-Americans. I don't think there's really any one and dones here, I guess, unless Donovan Klingon from UConn goes. Um, what does that say about the state of college basketball, and have we – move past a point when one and dones and McDonald's All-Americans can kind of shine on this stage, or is it just a kind of year-to-year -year thing, you think? I think the McDonald's All-Americans are usually only in college one year anyway, so you're only talking about X number of guys every year because most of them are gone after one year. And then those coaches that coach them do an incredible job if they get to this stage because you're basically taking a freshman and, and knowing it's going to be hard early to try to get them integrated, anybody, any freshman. McDonald's all American, not a McDonald's All-American. It's hard to get a freshman ready. And so those that get those freshmen ready for this stage by the end of the year do an incredible job coaching. I think if you were to ask them, they'd all like to have four- and five-year guys in their program. But the reality is if you can get great talent, you take it. But then it's hard to win with them because it takes a while for them to make the adjustment to the college game. It's just the fact of what we're doing. Any further questions for Coach Dutcher? If you have a question, raise your hand. With no more questions, we want to thank Coach Dutcher for joining us here in the main interview room. Coach, we'll see you again tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. San Diego State Locker Room is closed. Our next activity here in the main interview room is in about 18 minutes. We'll have student athletes from Miami, and the Miami Locker Room will be open at that time as well. Miami student athletes from 120 to 150. We'll have Coach Laranega here from 155 to 215. We'll see you back here in just a few moments.
They start at 120, which is the second. It's going to be Wong Miller Joker. five minutes. That Glaber Torres home run means we're at the five minute warning for student athletes from Miami. Hurricane student athletes will join us in just about five minutes. The Miami Hurricanes locker room will be open from 120 to 150 and beginning at 120. We'll be joined by student athletes Isaiah Wong, Jordan Miller, 
and Bensley Joseph. After a period of time, Nigel Pack, Norchad Omir, and Wugga Poplar will join us here in the main interview room as well. During the time that the student athletes are here in the main interview room, any of the Miami players who are not joining us here in the main interview room will be available for your questions and their answers in their locker room. Again, the locker room is open from 120 to 150, and we'll have Miami Hurricane student athletes here during that time as well. Coach Laranega joins us shortly after from 155 to 215 for a 20 minute period. He'll be here in the main interview room. So, Miami, 120 to about 215. Locker rooms open 120 to 150. And then Coach Laranega will be here from 155 to 215. Yeah, I've been making announcements. You didn't hear it? I thought I did it in a subtle enough way that only, you know. So far? I like that. I'm not. I'm getting texts. Just a reminder, if you're joining us here in the main interview room, use this time to silence your cell phone if you could. You can take photos, but please without a flash. No video recording devices, including your phone, and you cannot go live or stream with your phone. ASAP transcripts will be available immediately at the conclusion of this news conference, and video will be available shortly after at ncaa.veritone.com. For those of you who need it, the satellite information is as follows for this week and weekend. The satellite is Galaxy 17 Transponder 10 Slot A. The rate is 11.914, symbol 7.2, downlink 11886.5, vertical. That's for all the people that need that information back at their news stations. And for those of you Uplink fans in the room as well. The Miami locker room is now open and will be joined by Isaiah Wong, Jordan Miller, and Bensley Joseph in just a moment. After a few minutes with them, we'll be joined by Nigel Pack, Norchad O'Meer, and Wugga Poplar. Is that correct? Tomorrow. Tomorrow you get to deal with, you know, many, a myriad of talented moderators. Today you're stuck with the mediocre guy in the big room. But the any players that aren't in here, you can go get them in their locker room.
confirming that the Hurricanes locker room is now open and that Miami players are on their way. Miami has arrived. We're joined now by Isaiah Wong, Jordan Miller, and Bensley Joseph from Miami. Welcome, guys. Congratulations. Thank you. Got it. If you have a question for any of the players from Miami, please raise your hand and identify yourself by name and media outlet before we get to your question. Let's go to the middle from Miami. Chris DeMond, the Miami Hurricane. This is for anybody who wants to answer it. Now, obviously, you guys knew you were going to the Final Four a few days ago, but now that you were actually here, what are kind of some of your first impressions? Are you soaking in the moment? Let's get an answer from Bensley first, then a reflection from Jordan, and then an answer from Isaiah. Yes, I am, you know, just living this experience. You know, it's a dream come true. A lot of people, you know, in the world dream about playing in the Final Four. And, you know, it's a blessing. You know, we put in a lot of hard work all season, and this is the time now, so we're here just experience it. Jordan, your thoughts? Uh, I think Bensley sums it up pretty well. Um, yeah, you know, it's a blessing to be here. Uh, you know, we, we've worked all year really hard to, to get to stages like this, and uh, we're looking to make a deep run. Yeah, like, like both they said, it's a blessing to be here. You know, just living in the moment is just – it's a great, great time to be a Miami Hurricane fan right now. Up front to the left, Dan. Dan Walken, USA Today. For Isaiah, there was a period last year where there was talk that you would go in the transfer portal, and then you had to come out and say that you you were misrepresented there. I was just curious, after that, was there anything you had to do to sort of, uh, you know, make amends with, you know, coach, teammates, anything like that? How did you... How did you handle the fallout from that? Um, I called Coach L um, the day that happened, and he was um, he was comfortably fine with it. He knew that he trusted me. He knew like I was he I, I didn't make that accusation, so everybody was um, cool with me, and I didn't really have no problems coming in with the team. Everybody accepted me, and it was all we just all worked on the main goal and just kept on playing basketball. Center second row, Michelle Kaufman, Miami Herald. Um, for all you guys, have you stepped out there and have you seen a basketball arena with 72,000 seats? What, what did it feel like? Bensley first. We have not yet stepped out there, but I'm really excited to step out there and just see, you know, the huge facility we're playing. Since they haven't been out there. Is that okay? I'm yeah, you can follow. Question. Okay. Um, can I just uh, ask you then, totally on a different subject, UConn. You know, most people are still are picking them. They've been rolling through the tournament, winning by huge margins. Um, how do you think you guys match up with them, and what are the biggest challenges? Jordan, you want to take that first? Yeah, I'll take it. Um, first off, you know, credit to UConn. They're a great team. They played some good teams to get here. Um, you know, I think they got some really good guards um, that lead them in assists that really make the team run. Um, obviously, they have a really dominant big man uh, in, the, in the post who just swallows up rebounds and, and plays really hard. Um, you know, but I think personally we've had one of the hardest sides of the bracket. You know, I think we've played some really, really elite teams. Um, I mean, everybody, I believe, had us losing to all those teams. So, like, we're fine with being the underdogs. Um, we've been all year. But, um, you know, it should be a good game. Like I always say, I think the team that comes out and plays the hardest and leaves it all on the floor will be victorious. Isaiah, any thoughts on UConn? Um, UConn's a great team. They um, love to shoot the ball, and like Jordan said, they have a big man that gets the rebound and play hard, and they just they got here for a reason. So just us being the underdog, we got here for a reason too, so it's going to be a great game coming in. Fellas, we're going to go to the left side. This is the back left microphone for Billy. Uh, Billy Witz with the New York Times. <clears throat> Jordan, how, how, is, uh, how is name, image, and likeness 
opportunities changed your life personally? Um, yeah, I mean, it's been a blessing. I think not only for me, but for college athletes as a whole, um, being able to get involved into the business side of things um, and kind of see what that atmosphere is like. Uh, yeah, that's my best answer to that question. Billy, you want to follow up? Yeah, I guess, can, can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit of just some of the things, you know, whether it's, what about the business part of this have you, have you picked up on? And yeah, just um, dealing with contracts, uh, you know, dealing with professional businesses that, you know, want you to meet a certain time requirement, um, certain things, um, you know, it, it really opens your eyes to the other side um, other than just athletics. Um, so I think it's been, you know, a great experience for me and for everyone who gets involved in NIL. We have two questions up front. Let's go to the first row, then the second row. Then we're going to go to the right side, and then Adam will get back to you. What's up, guys? Josh from Fox in Miami. Just describe the feeling of you've worked all season for this, of just sitting up here, seeing the floor, and realizing today, you know, you're here at the Final Four. Um, it's a blessing. You know, God is great. You know, we worked a, a lot hard, you know, lots of hard work this season, you know, grinding ups and downs. And, you know, this is moments, again, we dream of and coming here competing in the Final Four stage on one of the biggest stages of them all. So just a surreal feeling and just trying to take it in every moment I can get. Jordan, same question. Yeah, um, here's what I'll say. You know, I, I, I feel like, you know, regardless of the outcome, we're, we're winners. Uh, we made school history. For the first time, Final Four. Um, obviously, you know we 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 still have goals we want to reach, but um, you know we're we're looking to just kind of set the foundation for Miami basketball, um, you know, and and just be what you know teams look up to and, and try to reach. Isaiah, um, it's a blessing just being at here, and I know it, all our players have been working hard and just getting morning sessions in and just getting feeling confident and just it's just a blessing just to be a part of this team and being part of being with Jordan Benz and we'll get all of them it's just um we have a great team this year and it's just um it's a feel like a big accomplishment just coming here in the final four and just realizing we're the top four teams and and the country just playing still playing basketball and there's not a lot of teams playing basketball right now so it's a big accomplishment for us. Second row, same area of the room. Marcus Benjamin, CanesCounty.com with Rivals. This is for Jordan. Obviously, you had a game for the ages last game, um, going perfect from the field and perfect from the line. What moment did you know that, that you were perfect during that game? And then also, if you could just describe the phone call that you got from Christian Leitner and just how that felt. Yeah, um, I, I didn't know I had a perfect game uh, until after the game. Um, someone came up and told me, uh, you know, being a competitor, I was just in the moment just trying to win, win a basketball game to get to the Final Four. Um, but, you know, it was cool. I joined some really, really elite company. Uh, got to talk to uh, Christian Leitner, which was always cool. You know, someone I watched documentaries on him hitting the shot. Uh, so it was definitely a cool experience. I was I was very much surprised. You know, they really kept it from me. So it was it was shocking. But you know, being able to talk to guys like him who've been on the big stage, played in the NBA, had um, a hell of a career. You know, is a, a dream come true. You can say. Guys, we're going to move to the right side. Jordan Kevin Fielder from Miles Twenty Four Seven. To be in a situation where it's you guys in Florida Atlantic in the Final Four, how cool is that? And how much of an impact can that have for? basketball in South Florida? Yeah, I think it's huge. Uh, you know, respect to both teams. We've put a lot of work in to get here. Um, I, I think, you know, people will take South Florida basketball more serious. Um, I would assume it's going to help with recruiting. Um, so, you know, both teams are just looking forward to build upon this time um, and keep the teams, you know, getting to this stage. Uh, yeah. Front and center, Adam. Adam Zagoria, New York Times. Isaiah, I know you're a Jersey guy. Do, do you have any connection to Danny or the Hurleys? Did you ever play for them, against them, or Adama or any of the Jersey guys on UConn? Um, I, they recruited me for when I was in high school. That's some um, connection I have. I, recruited, I got recruited there, and I spent a lot of time like thinking about UConn as a decision, and I feel like 
for me, I have like a lot of great connection with the coach and the assistants and all of them. So I say I have um, great connections with them. Uh, we got a follow up for Adam. Go ahead, Adam. Sorry, how how close did you come to going to UConn? And what was what was Danny's recruiting message to you? Um, it was like my top three decision. It was at Miami, UConn, and another school, but. Um, it was just um, it was close. I feel like, and if um, he would just um, he showed me a good time over there. He got got I got to meet a lot of people on the team, and they was all great people over there. And he was just a great coach. I feel like. On the right side. Hey Isaiah, Luke Cheney with Life All Sports. Just when you arrived on Miami in Miami in 2019 to you know where you're at now, how do you feel like the outlook and the public perception of Miami's program has changed and how do you feel like you've played a part in it? Um, I feel like the Miami program has changed from what I've been my freshman year to my senior year. I just um, feel like when I first came in here we was like uh, low, like we wasn't winning a lot of games and we were struggling at the time and we had a lot of players injured but I feel like uh, it was a learning process for me and the team. I feel like I feel like we had the we had a good team my freshman and sophomore year, but we just had a lot of injuries. But going through the season, we, we just progressed and we just kept on going and feeling confident. And we got transfers that helped us. And it's just a great accomplishment just seeing how I went from my freshman to not a very great season to a senior. And I'm in the final four right now. So I feel like I got the best world on both sides. We're going to stay in that same area of the room on the right side. Isaiah. Kevin Gilda from Alice 24-7. You guys played FAU early in the season last year, and obviously both teams have changed since then. But when you guys played them, did you sort of see that that team was building towards, you know, making a tournament run? Um, to be honest, I did not see this coming. But I feel like last year they was a very great team, and we only won – last year we only beat them by a buzzer beater. And they was very competitive, and they played hard, and they was just a great team to compete with us. And – like now they're in the final four and they're they're making great things and they're and they're a great team. Back to Michelle in second row center. Yeah, I want to go back to the UConn thing. I, I happened to run, run into your mom in the airport today. Um, she said, "Was UConn your <coughs> the only other school that you visited? UConn and Miami were the two schools that you actually took visits to." Yes, it actually it actually was. And then what? And you said there was a third school. There were three finalists. So it was UConn, Miami, and. Um. I really forgot, but okay. it was and probably so, just me. And you, so but, why did you pick Miami? What was it when you were weighing UConn in Miami? What was it about Miami that, that swayed you in that direction? What tipped the scales for you? Um, I feel like the coaching staff, um, when they had Adam Fisher, he was a great coach, and he, he talked to me a lot, and I felt real comfortable being around him, and Coach L was a great coach. And I feel like at the time I was already committed to Miami, and I really had my decision made. But when I visit UConn, I was like, it's a hard, it's going to be a hard decision coming in because they have a great coaching staff, they have a, great, they have great people over there too, and I liked, uh, and they have great players over there. I just love the way they work too. So it was like it was a hard decision, but I already had my mindset on Miami, and it was a, it was a up between them, them two. Final question for Isaiah or Jordan or Bensley's second row. Uh, Adam Benz with the Journal Inquirer. Isaiah, knowing that UConn and Miami were your top two schools, like, is it funny how the world works that we're here right now and you're getting ready for this game? Yes, it is funny. It's a small world, I feel like, just between UConn and Miami and now I'm playing UConn in the Final Four. is just a... It's just, like I said, a small world just having these two teams come in. We're just having these two teams playing against each other. We want to thank Isaiah Wong, Jordan Miller, and Bensley Joseph. They're going to do the radio interviews next. And in just a moment, we'll have Nigel Pack, Norchad O'Meara, and Wugga Poplar join us up here in the main interview room. Cool. Miami Locker Room continues to be open.
guys want to start, or no, you want to wait? We'll be joined by Wooga Poplar, Nigel Peck, and Norchad O'Meara in just a moment. The Hurricanes locker room remains open for the student-athletes who did not join us or will not join us down here in the interview room. And then Coach Laranega's interview time with us begins 1.55 and ends at 2.15. I went and got some water instead of checking my text through the app, but I'll check it out. Every time I check, they hit a home run, so maybe I'll check again. Well, you know, you can only ask for so much. We're joined right now by Nigel Pack and Wooga Poplar. And Nigel's 10-gallon hat. In just a moment, we'll be joined by Norchad O'Meara when he wraps up with radio. But we'll take some questions for Nigel or Wooga. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We're going to send uh, one of our intrepid microphone stewards in your direction. Please state your name and affiliation and then your question. Here comes the mic. Front left. Front right. Hey, Wooga. Uh, Luke Chain with Life Fault Sports. You mentioned last weekend how... During that comeback against Texas, you have to remind Coach L not to, you know, look at the scoreboard when that whole thing was happening. I'm just curious how vital you think it is to your team's success that there's an environment in place where both players and coaches can hold each other accountable. Oh, uh, yeah, I feel like we just have that type of relationship where though we could tell each other right from wrong, and I feel like that was the time me telling them just not to look at the score and just to play the game. Next question for the student athletes from Miami, and we're joined now by Norchad O'Meara as well. Let's go to the second row, center, and Michelle from the Miami Herald. Oh, I got it. I got it. Thank you. Michelle Kaufman from Miami Herald. Norchad, I want to ask you um, a lot of people say that one of the keys to this game is, you know, will you be able to stay out of foul trouble? Uh, obviously, someone who's your opponent would want to get you into foul trouble. How do you how do you plan on on uh, dealing with that and you know staying out of foul trouble when coach always talks about how you're so aggressive and energetic? Yeah. That's Norchad's microphone in the center there. Yeah, I think I don't want to jinx it. I don't want to talk about it, but you know, just play smart. Don't do, don't do like you know choose which places go at, which places don't go at. No, just play a smart basketball. Continuing with questions for Norchad, Nigel, or Wooga. On the right side. Kevin Fielder, I was 24-7. Wooga, uh, Wooga, you guys played against FAU last season, uh, and it was kind of early in the season, but what did you see from them when you guys played them and, you know, for them to now get to this point in the Final Four with you guys? How cool is that to see to see two South Florida teams in the Final Four? Oh, yeah, I saw uh, a really great team in them because I feel like they hit the buzzer beater. I think last year he hit the buzzer beater off them, so they was in the game with us a lot. And I feel like they really had their, like, their defensive end and some type of offense. So I feel like them on the defensive pressure, it was really great for them. Next questions on the left side to the right of the aisle. Dan? Dan Walken, USA Today for, for Nigel. As you were going through the transfer to Miami, obviously everything was extremely public about the NIL deal and everything like that. How did how did that sort of um, change your approach, or did it maybe sort of come at you in a, in a way you didn't expect, just given the public nature of everything? 
Uh, no, I mean, it, all that mattered was my teammates accepted me, and they did that from day one. My coaching staff, everybody accepted me and took me in as a brother. Um, we, we never seemed to talk about it as a team. Nobody, you know, came at me negatively, and we, we, we played together so much. You can see it's obviously working off really well now. Um, I feel like that's the reason why this team is so good, because our bond is so strong. I um, mean, nothing with NIL with anybody on this team has ever affected us in, in a negative way. Back to Michelle, second row center. Nigel, I want to ask you, I see you've got the, uh, the official Final Four hat on. Um, what does it feel like to be in the Final Four? You know, what did you anticipate and what is it really like? Have you, have you taken a peek out there at the floor yet at how big this arena is? And Coach was talking about with his experience in a Final Four that playing in a, in a stadium like that is almost like playing outdoors. What do you think it's going to be like and how do you think that might affect your shooting? Um, yeah, I never played in a dome before, so this is this is my first experience, um, my first Final Four ever. Never been to one, never uh, been in attendance in one. So you know, I'm really excited for this, loving the experience that we're getting so far. Um, everything about it has been so much fun, and we only seen just a, a glimpse of it. I haven't got to see the floor yet or anything like that, um, but I'm excited to see it. Um, I actually got some advice from um, Kyle Guy, who went to my same high school as me, who went to Virginia, won a national championship. I was talking to him a little bit. He just told me to stay stay positive. I mean, you know, you got to keep confidence in yourself. Um, great shooters can shoot anywhere uh, is what he told me. And he told me to believe in myself and my team. And if you believe in yourself and your team, um, that you guys will be able to win it all. We're going to go to Kevin. Three seats in. There we go. Yeah, Norchad, uh, Kevin Sweeney here from Sports Illustrated. I'm curious, you know, growing up in, in Nicaragua, like what are your memories? What do you think about when you think about March Madness? So mm -hmm. growing up as a child, I really didn't – watch March Madness like that, that. I was a baseball player. Then when I get older, you know, watching Duke teams like Duke, North Carolina, and that March Madness was just like, damn, that's crazy. And now I'm here, so it's just like, so I'm just so excited to be here with my brothers. You know, we pump, but also we locked in at the same time. Next question is to the right of the aisle, Lane. That's the back left microphone. Go ahead, Lane. All right. Um, Lane Higgins, Wall Street Journal. This is for you, Nigel. Um, obviously, transitioning into a point guard, it's maybe a little more intense of a role with some of the ball handling and decision making. But what did you find to be the biggest, um, you know, difficulty or biggest challenge in, you know, in adopting a new role on this Miami team? And, you know, who, who kind of helped you through that? Yeah, this uh, my coaching staff and my teammates really helped me through this, this transition, you know, coming from a, a role where I was a primary scorer in my old school and now coming to a role where I have a lot of talent and, you know, uh, distributing the ball to my teammates when they need it. Um, it was just a change, but you know, I played point guard my entire life. Um, it was just going back into my old habits. Um, my teammates made it really easy for me, uh, and that's what the summertime and the fall was for to help me transition to that. And I feel like my coaching staff, uh, especially Coach L, gave me a lot of confidence in the things that I was doing to help me, you know, get prepared for this for moments like this. We'll head back to the second row center, Michelle. Can I ask one in Spanish for Northchild? Is that okay? You may. Yes. Okay. No, te quería, quería preguntar que eh, ahora que tú, es como una, que tú eres una estrella ahora en, en los Estados Unidos, en el March Madness. Sí, hay muchos, juven, muchos jugadores jóvenes en Nicaragua que te están mirando en la televisión. Si tú crees que va a haber más gente mirando eh, este torneo y este campeonato como tú estás, porque ya yo vi ayer banderas de Nicaragua cuando se fueron las guaguas. Habían banderas de Nicaragua. Puedes hablar sobre el apoyo, eh, el apoyo que, que te dan la gente de Nicaragua. Gracias. Sí, pues han sido fantásticos todas las personas de Nicaragua. Y no solo los nicaragüenses, los latinos en general han sido muy buenos. Ya yeah, solo tengo cosas buenas de hablar de ellos. Estoy muy agradecido con ellos por no solo apoyarme a mí, sino a todo el equipo. Y, y muchas gracias a, al país de Nicaragua. por Y espero que, que lo vean, que vean los juegos y, y nos apoyen. Nor Chad, would you mind briefly translating also? I don't remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> no me acuerdo. Uh, next question for the student athletes. Let's go to the right <laughs> side, center. <laughs> this guy. Yeah, Chris DeMond, uh, the Miami Hurricane. Nor Chad, you know, last year you were in the Sun Belt playing for Arkansas State, and then you went to the ACC, and now you're in the NCAA tournament. It seems over the past year you've just been playing on bigger and bigger stages, and now you're on the biggest stage in college basketball, the Final Four. How do you kind of adjust to all that increased pressure, and how are you going to do that for Saturday? No, you know, I, I got to 
give that to my teammates. You know, they trusted me. You know, the, when I reached the Miami, they welcomed me with open arms. And they just guide me, you know, to the ACC. I know we are here together. So I, I don't I don't think it's, I don't feel pressure personally because I'm with my, my teammates I've been all year. So, you know, I just feel good and excited we're here right now. That same area of the room. Uh, Luke Cheney with Life All Sports. This question could go for everyone. Just, you know, what stands out about UConn when watching them on film? We'll go. You want to take that one first? Uh, uh, I feel like the offense, the offense is really good. I feel like the way how they can score the ball is just at the highest level. North Chad, you want to take that one too? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, UConn is a great team. Got to give them credit. You know, they've been blowing out all the teams they play, at least 15 points. So, you know, they have inside presence, outside presence. We just got to stick to the game plan, you know, worry more about, about Miami than about UConn. Nigel. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're coached really well. Um, their coaches, you know, their program has, you know, been a great program in, in the past. Um, this is something that, you know, they've been in multiple times. Um, we know how good of a team they are. They got a lot of talent from the inside and outside with a lot of size and things like that. Um, but as long as we stick to you know what Miami does best, um, I think we should be in good shape. Final question is going to come from John Fanta, left side, right of the aisle. Hey, guys. Uh, John Fanta from Fox Sports. Do you guys have any, uh, with him in the vicinity, maybe, any Coach Laranega favorite quote, favorite moment that comes to mind? And is there any truth to the rumor that he might have uh, taken some dan dance classes ahead of the Final Four this week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like Coach L learned all his dance moves from me from last year. I used to dance a lot, so I feel like he just learned all of them from me. <laughs> Norchad, anything to add? Yeah, I, I agree. You know, I, I watched videos from last year, they in the Elite Eight. Sweet 16, Wood would be dancing, Bensley would be dancing, and I think Coach L copied a lot of those moves from them. Yeah. <laughs> Final thought on that, Nigel? Uh, yeah, I mean, his, his dance moves, they're all right. <laughs> I'm hoping to see some more, though. I only seen once, so I need to see it again. We want to thank Nigel, Norchad, and Wilga for joining us here in the main interview room. We're going to have Coach Larry Nega next if you want to ask him similar questions. We're joined now by Miami head coach Jim Laranega. Coach, could you begin with a statement, and then we'll take some questions. Um, how great are those kids? Uh, their personalities, they're just so much fun to be around. They, they ex ex exude confidence in themselves, but they, they also um, believe in each other. And just listening to them, they're enjoying this experience, taking it all in, and uh, I'm hoping the emotions of, of the size of the venue, uh, that they'll be able to con channel their emotions in the right direction because they know this is a, a, a challenge to get to the Final Four. There have been a lot of great players, a lot of great teams that have never reached this point in their playing career or coaching career. So you got to appreciate every opportunity you get. And we're just looking forward to playing Saturday night. Coach, we're going to begin on the right side of the room, just to the left of the aisle. Chris, let's get a microphone to Chris. This will be the back right microphone. Thank 
Thank you. Chris Bunham with ESPN. Coach, we've seen a lot of great coaches step aside and retire over the last couple years. I'm curious for you, and you maybe just answered it talking about your players. What about this team? What about this sport still brings you joy? You know, I might be 73 years old, but I think age is just a number. I just love doing what I'm doing. I love coaching basketball. I've done it for 51 years, and I hope to do it a lot longer. And what makes it so enjoyable are the players. And uh, I tell the players all the time, the, the court is my classroom, and you are my students. And I'm going to teach you as much as I can. And learn as much as you can. Improve as much as you can. Because all these guys want to play beyond college. They all want to be professional basketball players. And the best way to do that, no matter how good you are when you come into a college setting, is get better, improve. Uh, Increase your stock, they say. So, uh, but I, I enjoy the growth. If you if you look at a, an Isaiah Wong, see where he was as a freshman and where he is now, you can't imagine it. I mean, the, the guy has gotten so much better in everything. And Wooga Poplar is on that same track. He didn't do as much as a freshman as he probably hoped for, but we could see his potential. And, and now he's demonstrating that, and by next year, he, he's going to be a monster. Coach, we'll go to the third row on the left side. Dana? Uh, Dana O'Neill at The Athletic. Along the lines of what Chris was asking you, there are a lot of people that are fed up or what have you with the profession and things like that and, and don't feel like they are relevant or can stay relevant anymore. Why do you think that you can and why aren't you fed up? Well, my wife and I have been married for 51 years. I was an assistant coach to Terry Holland at both Davidson and Virginia for 10 years. And my wife and I learned from Terry and Ann Holland that if you can create a family atmosphere and have a great relationship with your players, you can have a great basketball program. And so when I got uh, the opportunity to coach at Bowling Green and then George Mason and now Miami, my wife and I have just tried to make the players like a part of our family. My coach is a part of our family. We've enjoyed the relationship we've had with them on the court and off the court. And I, don't, I, don't, I haven't changed at all. Uh, I still teach the same things, the fundamentals of the game. We still adapt a lot of things, not, not changing, just, okay, adapting. We're going to play this ball screen differently or we're going to attack this opponent differently. Uh, so, and, and I think the players... When they come in, they think they know everything about basketball, and they quickly find out, oh, wait a minute, I didn't know about that. So they learn, they get better, and as a result, with these guys, they're like a sponge. They want to learn as much as they possibly can, and, and by doing that, uh, the team has just gotten better and better from the start of the season till today. Coach, we'll move one row back. Billy? Uh, Billy, Billy Witz with the New York Times. Um, the, the team success the last couple of years and just the, with what the women have done this year has really kind of shined a light on Miami too. And also um, just with what NIL has, has done. And I'm just wondering if you can kind of characterize from your point of view of just how, the, just the importance of having somebody in this era like John Ruiz and what that's been able to do for your for yeah. Miami athletics. Yeah, you, you look at it a different way than, than I would look at it. I think the university made a decision over a year ago uh, to provide the resources and support for all of our athletic teams. Uh, the president announced in an email that, that uh, Rudy Fernandez and Joe Echeverria was going to take on a more of a role when it came to athletics. And that role has turned out to be hugely successful because those guys have provided the resources for me, for Katie, uh, for our football program, and our, our other athletic teams. Uh, I, I think uh, the transfer portal has had a far greater impact because I, I don't think any of us would be here without the transfers. And what those guys are looking for is just a better landing spot. Some of them had, like Norshad O'Meara, had a great two years at, at Arkansas State and Nigel Pack had a had great two years at Kansas State but Nigel was looking to move to the point guard position he wasn't going to be able to do that at Kansas State we had Charlie Moore graduating so he could look at our program and say oh I'm a really good fit I'm like Charlie Moore and he is 
he can score like Charlie. He runs the team like Charlie. He's a great quarterback. And, and so he's fit those, that role and, 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 and uh, made himself very valuable. Norshad O'Meara, he went to high school. He went to Miami Prep. Our whole community is, is very, uh, most of them are very Spanish speaking, not me. I don't speak Spanish. I'm only Cuban, but I don't speak Spanish. But, but my point is, Norshad loved Miami when he was at prep, and, and it was a, a natural for him to come back. But the thing that, that makes, makes it, um, me enjoy it so much is it, it's not, not about whether a kid transferred in or we recruited him out of high school or he got an NIL deal. Is My job is to coach him and make him the best basketball team they can be. And these guys have bought into everything that I consider to be the Miami way. This is the way we're going to do things. And it's never been an issue with not a single guy, not with our freshmen, sophomores, juniors, or seniors. Second row center, Michelle. Michelle Kaufman, Miami Herald. Uh, Jim, when you first came here, I remember you like going into the dorms with pizzas, trying to get kids to pay attention to your program. And nobody was really paying attention, to be honest, or very few people. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could reflect a little on what it felt like yesterday to be like mm -hmm. Moses parting the sea of fans. Uh, you know, they had to have security moving people out of the way for you to get onto the bus. You know, can you just talk a little bit about the about the evolution of the, you know, begging people to come and now having people, you know, pushing you over to get on the bus? I had the great privilege of being at the University of Virginia back in the early 80s with Ralph Sampson and Jeff Lamp and Rick Carlisle, Olden Polonese, great teams. We had great fan support that watching, watching Virginia, the way it operated was very much first class. And I thought if I could ever get a head coaching job in the ACC, that's the way I would want to build our program and build up a fan base with the student support, with the community support. And, and so when my staff and I got there, my coaching staff and I discussed and go, okay, what are our steps? And I said, the first thing is we have to understand we have to recruit everybody, not just recruits, but fans. And uh, my first week on the job, I went to Sir Pizza. Do you remember Sir Pizza right by uh, Merrick, Merrick Park? And four young men walked in. They were like teenage years, like 12, 13, 14. And I stopped eating my pizza and went over to them and said, hey, do you guys play basketball? And they all pointed to one young man. I said, you play basketball? And he said, yeah. I said, what's your name? He said, Matthew. I said, what's your last name? He said, Matthew Deutsch. Oh, I said, are you David Deutsch's son? He said, yeah. I said, well, you tell your dad to send you to my camp. That was one camper. A young lady, Kim Manor, came over to me and said, hey, I have a son. Can he come to your camp? I said, how old is he? he she said, five, but he's a great athlete. And I said, well, my grandson's coming, and he's five, so they can be kind of friends. So they did. We try to build the camp up. And my message was this to my staff and to the community. Look, at, we, want, we, we want you to, to join us. The, our players coach the kids at camp. They're going to be friends. Come to our games. Buy season tickets. I said that every day. Buy season tickets. Buy season tickets. Come to our games. And so the players did. And I told them very, very clearly, if we win, I want you to come down to the locker room and say hello to the guys who coached you this summer, the guys on the team that you're watching on TV. But if we lose, go home. No, no, nobody, nobody wants to talk to you after a loss. And so we kept building. This year alone, we invited a Category 5, the Spirit Group, uh, there were 80 members of our, of our law school came to, came to a practice. We had the band come to a practice just to watch and get to know our guys, and we ate a meal with them afterwards. Everything is about inclusion. So our, our, our job as coaches, I know it's to coach the sport, but it's really to be an ambassador for great universities. Miami's a great university, one of the top 50, top 50 schools in the country. The city is paradise. It's 75 degrees every day. I go for a walk and go for a, a smoothie every day just so I can sit on campus and, and look at the beautiful venue we live in. Did I answer your question? I don't even remember what you asked. <laughs> 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 
Oh, yeah. So what, what has happened through my 12 years is everything has grown in the right direction. We've got greater support for the program. We've got greater fans coming to the program. More people are aware of us. We're in the great ACC. It's a great conference. And so the students really got behind us very early. And that's just grown and grown and grown. And now the, the community of Coral Gables. We have 5,000 tickets sold to come to Houston. 12 years ago, that, that, that wasn't even possible. But now everybody's behind us. We're going to have a great, great uh, support come, come Saturday night. Left side to the right of the aisle, Dan. Dan Walken, USA Today. Jim, there was a time a year ago where you know, Nigel was coming in, and then there was a comment attributed to Isaiah that he was maybe going to go in the portal. <laughs> a lot of things were, were public, and maybe people looked at this and said, boy, this is the new world of college sports. It's going to be a nightmare why hasn't it been a nightmare for, for this team? And, and were you, was there a point where you were worried just the public nature of all that might affect, affect your locker room? I, 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 honestly, no. Even when all that stuff was going on with Isaiah, he called me. He said, Coach, I'm not going anywhere. He told me that. You know, so what, what the public perception is is not the reality. The reality is Nigel came on campus, went into the gym. Isaiah was there. They became best friends overnight. They clicked immediately. Why? They love basketball. They're gym rats. They love to compete, and they want to win. And so for me, my job was easy. I just do what I do. I go into the gym, and I coach them, and I don't worry about that other stuff. I know the media makes a, a bigger thing about that, and, and I think it's, it's, it's a misperception for our program. I don't know about other programs of, of how NIL affected them, but there has been not a single day of, of negativity in our program based on NIL. Coach, we're going to move over to the right side. Hey, Luke. Hey, Coach. Luke Cheney with Life All Sports. Do you feel that you approach the tournament or the Final Four and the event itself any differently than you did in 2006? Or is that something that stayed consistent even now, 17 years later? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I would say I'm more patient right now than I was back then. Um, I was probably a better dancer back then. But here, here's what I would say in life, you, you learn every day. I read a lot, I, I, I try to learn uh, and try to pass that along to our players. You know, I'm always preaching the seven habits of highly effective people. Uh, we have a philosophy based on attitude, commitment, and class that I'm preaching to the players all the time. You know, honestly, Luke, I, I feel like um, if all I ever did with my life was teach kids how to dribble, pass, and shoot, my, my life would not be very worthwhile. I feel like my job is to mentor them and to help prepare them when they're no longer playing basketball to learn life skills to develop their own philosophy, own values of the things that are important to them. That's what I learned from my high school coach, and he was my inspiration for wanting to get into coaching. And I have a lot of guys now who have played for me or worked for me that are doing great in coaching as well. So I feel like we're, we're doing a good job. Coach, we'll stay in that same area of the room. Hey, Coach, uh, Kevin Fielder from Owls 24-7. You went on that run in 2006. Now I feel you sort of going on their own run how important can FAU's run be for basketball in South Florida, and how much can it do, do you think, for the university? Yeah, we, we played them last year. Dusty May and his staff have done an incredible job. We were lucky to beat them by two at their place, and they, they've just grown from there. And as far as I'm concerned, I hope every 8- to 18-year-old that's still growing and trying to find a school, I hope they follow FAU in Miami during this Final Four and decide – I'm going to play basketball is going to be my primary sport because that's really how your sport really uh, evolves. When, when the Orlando Magic and the Miami Heat, uh, their franchises began, when was that, like 86 or something like that, that all of a sudden basketball became a major sport in the state. And we have a lot of great young players in, in Coral Gables and in Miami that are going to be very highly recruited. And there's a lot of great players throughout the state, and this only enhances it. 
that their run and our run will, will, will make it. Kids watching TV will make it like, man, I want to do that. Coach, left side, left of the aisle. Coach, Mike Cunha, CBS News, Miami. Off the top, you mentioned telling your players to stay in the moment and, and enjoy it. How are you staying in the moment and really savoring this trip? Yeah, well, I'm with you guys. I, I like talking to the media. I get a chance to tell some stories about the guys I love. You know, these guys are so much fun to be around. Someone said to me, are you, are you tired of this? I said, no, what, what could be better than, than having a conversation or, or meeting someone and, and telling them how much fun you're having? All right? And I, I hope you guys have fun covering us. You know, I, I want our players to enjoy this moment because you know what? It'll last a lifetime. 17 years ago, and you guys are still asking me about our, our run to the, to the Final Four at George Mason. It never stops. For these guys, they'll be telling stories to their grandchildren, saying, oh, man, I played in the Final Four. We went to Houston. Oh, like, yeah. Did you win? <laughs> That'll be what it's like. And, and uh, so we're having a blast. I'm staying in the moment and just having fun with it. We're going to go right of the aisle to Lane and then left of the aisle to Tom. Hey, Coach L, this is Lane Higgins from the Wall Street Journal. And you made some comment uh, sometime earlier in the tournament about how you're old, your players are not old, they're experienced. But, you know, in that end, even though they are maybe upperclassmen, juniors, and seniors, like, you're not getting any closer in age to your players, and yet technology is probably making that gap a little bit more felt. So how do you, how do you still relate to these guys that are 18, 19, 20? And, like, is Wuga showing you TikTok dances? Like, what sort of stuff is happening that helps bridge that gap? Yeah, I, I just think uh, my relationship with my players has is, is all been, been based on love. I, I love the guys I've coached. Uh, someone was talking to a, uh, a few of my former players back in my George Mason days, Tremaine Price and George Evans, and they, they were asked the difference, and Tremaine said yeah, his dancing's gotten worse. So I, I just think... Uh, when you care about people and they know you care about them and you try to help them in every way you can, you know, you're sharing meals with them, you're traveling on airplanes, on buses, and, you know, it, m me, I haven't changed. If anything, I, I've, I've gotten uh, a little more patient and a little calmer. But other than that, um, I'm still the same guy I was when I got my first head coaching job at 36. Left of the aisle, Tom. Angelo, Palm Beach Post. Um, do you see parallels between 2006 George Mason and FAU this year? And is there any more of a sense of accomplishment or joy when you take a program like that, a mid-major, to, to this venue? Yeah, well, first of all, the tag mid-major means nothing to me because I think anybody that makes the dance is good. 68 teams, all you got to look at is the upsets and say, what, that team was no good, but they still won? No, they're good. But... The matchup, how you match up with an opponent, how you can attack their defense and defend their players is huge. Some, sometimes you match up very well and sometimes you don't. Um, FAU's run, yes, is very similar to, to George Mason's because no one anticipated it. When, when we got with, at George Mason, they didn't even think we'd get invited. We were 11 seed. Everybody thought we'd get crushed by Michigan State in the first round. In FAU's case, I can't believe anybody thought they couldn't get here. They had over 30 wins. I mean, you can't win 30 games in college basketball. The parity in college basketball now is at the highest it's ever been. And that's due to the transfer portal. Because guys are going from, let's say a, a kid is a really good ACC player, but he doesn't get the playing time he's looking for. All right? So he transfers to a mid-major, and now all of a sudden... He's the key cog in them getting to the next step. Or like we see in the ACC, some guy has a great career in the mid-major, but he, now he's got one more year of eligibility and transfers to the ACC, and he fits beautifully into that team and helps them get to the national championship game like Brady Manick did last year with Carolina. There are just so many. The game of basketball is about synergy about guys working together. You've got to develop that chemistry. And it helps if, if you have it on the court and off the court. Up front, on the left. 
Hey, Coach. Josh Moser from Fox in Miami. Great to be here. Great to see you in person. You see that smile right there. Just how much fun are you having? Yeah. You know, for, for a basketball coach, the Final Four is the dream, you know. And when I was a player, uh, I dreamt about playing in the Final Four. And if we had beaten Villanova at Villanova in my senior year, uh, we had a player named Ernie DiGregorio who missed a free throw when we were up one, and Villanova scored at the buzzer. So we went to the NIT, and Villanova went to the national championship game. I looked at that and said, dang, that could have been us. When I got into coaching, it was, I hope that can be us. When I got to Virginia, it was us twice, 81 and 84. When I got to George Mason, I, had a, I was interviewing assistant coaches for a position I had open, and one of the guys who applied for the job said to me, I really want to come here because I know you help your assistants, and I really want to get to the ACC or Big East so I can get to the Final Four. And then I, I told a friend of mine, well, he's out. And he said, why? And I said, because I want him to help George Mason get to the Final Four. Two years later, we did. On the right side, third row. Hey, Jim, Luke DeCock, Raleigh News and Observer. Uh, you were asked earlier about, you know, the, especially in the ACC, the number of sort of coaches who have moved on in the last two years. You were very vocal last spring about how you felt like the league had been short, shortchanged a bit. Do you feel more of an obligation now to speak about things like that than you did when there were sort of more of your peers who had that, that sort of pulpit? Uh, I, actually, I, I just feel anybody associated with the ACC should be blowing our horn. Because I've been disappointed the last two years we've only got five teams in. Because I've had to compete against those coaches and teams and know how good they are. But I also know the parity in that other teams can can – advance in the NCAA tournament and deserve a shot. So my answer to really the question is let's expand the NCAA tournament to at least 96 teams because there's just so many more good teams. You say, oh, no, they're average. No, you get into the big dance, you're good. And you can see the different leagues. You look at what, what uh, uh, North Texas and UAB are getting ready to play for the NIT championship, right? Isn't that FAU's league? Come on, their league is good, our league is good. I coached at Bowling Green, the, the, the Mid-American Conference was very good. So expand the dance and, and let's have more kids experience the fun of competing in the NCAA tournament and be a part of March Madness. Second row. Uh, Adam Betts with the Journal Inquirer. Coach, obviously you played UConn in that 2006 run at George Mason. Do you remember anything about that game at all? Or everything about that game? I remember every, What do you want to know? <laughs> we were down 12 with 12 seconds to go in the first half. We, we uh, Following Campbell, drove to the basket, got fouled by their backup center. I can't remember his name. Big, strong kid. Uh, got fouled. He made the layup, made the free throw. We're down nine. And I went, went into the locker room, and I, I quite frankly just said to the players, we got these guys right where we want them. And they were like, what do you mean? I said, they think this game is over. They, they, they're ahead, and there's no stopping them. We've just begun to play. We're going to make a couple of adjustments in our offense and defense and just go out and execute the game plan. And we did. Uh, Lamar Butler made a, a three-pointer and got fouled on it. We cut the lead. We tied the game up. And then it went back and forth. And then uh, <laughs> we, we were um, up to 76-74 or 74-72. Uh, and they made a fast break layup uh, after a missed free throw to tie the game and put it in overtime, and everybody thought, okay, now George Mason is done for. But our guys rose to the occasion, executed beautifully at both ends, and we were able to win in overtime. We want to thank Coach Laranega for joining us here in Thanks the main everybody. interview room. Coach, we'll see you again tomorrow.
normally, he's normally great at what he did, does he really, he dropped the ball. He dropped the ball. I mean, I did raise my hand like towards the beginning. I'm gonna buy you a beer later now. Uh, uh, like I ain't drink anything. Now you'll get nothing in like it. Like Spalding. Nothing in like it. Plus, you gotta have you speak Spanish so you can tell that you get I know, I had a good question. There's AP stuff. Two thirty. Two thirty, huh? So eleven minutes. That's the coaches so, and the sure. So don't get the microphone up until I recognize the person, okay. and then get it back right away. Okay. They don't have yeah, to talk into it in your hand, like but if they're, you know, like uh, you, we went to the wrong guy. Oh, you know what happened to you guys? Was they gave it to the wrong guy? Okay. And then this guy missed it. So two guys from South Florida sit next to you. How many questions did South Florida get? They got they got one each. Who got two questions this first time? Just Noel. I hear you. Your town's got a question. Well, no, that's it. See where she's your town, you know? <laughs> Mark, do you know, um, excuse, excuse me, ma'am, do you know if, can we uh, take Kelsey a video Tara. or no? Um, can you uh, make an announcement? I think oh, okay. I see. Mark, what is the policy on the video? Yeah, still photos, good, no flash. Video, no good. No good. Streaming, no good. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Let me check on you.
it, it is. It's labeled on the right side on the white piece of paper. That was important. The pin. It comes in my bag. I don't know. Gotcha. It, my last pin got me into the Dre, Dre Club in Las Vegas forever. Oh, good. Well, that's good. So that's why it's important for me it's to awesome. get a pin. Oh, I got him. I, I'm, I'm talking to him. That I don't. That's a cool pin. Do, do you have one of these? What? The Hall of Fame? I do. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Caravan, Jackson, Denovo.
We're about to be joined by student athletes from the University of Connecticut. Joining us first will be Joey Calcaterra, Donovan Klingen, and Jordan Hawkins. Following a brief period, Alex Caraban, Andre Jackson Jr., and Adama Sinogo will join us as well. The UConn locker room is now open. It'll be open from 2.30 to 3 p.m. We'll have student athletes from UConn here during that time. Again, Calcaterra, Klingon, and Hawkins, followed by Caraban, Jackson Jr., and Sonogo. And then the head coach, Dan Hurley, will be here with us in the main interview room from 3.20 until 3.40. If you're joining us in the main interview room for these student athlete and coach interviews, a reminder to please use this opportunity to silence your cell phone. You're allowed to take photos, but no flash. The UConn locker room is open again from right now until about three o'clock. No recording of any video in this room or streaming that includes with your mobile phone. ASAP transcripts will be available immediately following the news conference and video will be available at ncaa.veritone. .com. Well, we'll, go, we'll get underway. We'll get started. Okay. We're joined right now by Donovan Klingen and Jordan Hawkins of UConn. Joey Calcaterra will join us in just a moment. If you have a question for Donovan or Jordan, please raise your hand. One of our attendants will make their way over to you with their microphone. We'll go to the center for AP. Hi. AP Stedham, AP and Kelly, as we see at Syndicated Radio. Uh, Donovan and Jordan, how does Miami defend your position and when did you feel during the season that you had a chance to reach Houston, Texas? Um, I mean, I feel like, you know, Miami likes to front the post a little bit. Um, you know, they're very aggressive. Uh, you know, they, they try to get their hands in the passing lanes. And, you know, when you're driving in the lane, they try to strip down on the ball. Um, you know, and to answer your question about, you know, when I thought, you know, we could go to Houston, you know, beginning of the year when we were on a 14-0 run, um, when a lot of games playing at our best. Um, you know, I thought we had a chance to make a deep run. You know, we obviously went 
through a tough stretch, but I feel like that made us stronger and made us better. Being joined by Tristan Newton now as well. Let's go to the back of the room. I'm Michael Cohen from Fox Sports. Uh, this question is for Jordan. Jordan, it looks like there's been some times this year where you've had a chance to talk to guys like Ray Allen and, and Richard Hamilton, guys that move without the ball similar to the way you do. I'm curious what their insights have provided you and, and what it's like to have that resource available to you playing at a place like UConn. Um, I mean, meeting them is a blessing for sure. Um, as soon as I got to UConn, I knew I knew those type of guys were going to, those guys, the type of guys played here, and I had to live up to that standard. Uh, so it's amazing that I got these two guys in my corner. I can go to them anytime and ask them a question about how, how I can get my jump shot off quicker. Or it, it's, all, it's, a, it's an amazing feeling, and I'm just uh, blessed to have those two. Unlimited questions for Zach Braziller from the New York Post. Uh, Zach Braziller, New York Post. Uh, Jordan, what? What do you think is the biggest difference for you from, from last year to this year? Was there anything specific you did in the off season or um I think just my mentality changed completely. Um I felt like I had the skill to do it, uh to do what I can do now last year, but my mental wasn't wasn't all the way there with my game, so I think that's the biggest thing that changed. If Zach Zach has a follow up, please how, Zach. How did your mental change? Um, I mean, just getting older, uh, growing as a player, uh, getting more experience in the Big East, playing with the guys, getting used to my program. Um, so, yeah. Next question is for Lane. Lane's in the center of the room, same area. Hey there. Um, this is for either Donovan or Jordan. But obviously there was a couple of transfers that came in that provided a lot more senior leadership to this team and that pretty much everyone from last year's team that was an upperclassman left. Yeah. You know, how important was it to have those that piece in the mix this year? And, you know, what do you think players like Tristan bring? Jordan first, please. Then Don. Um, I mean, yeah, it, last year we had a completely different team. We had a lot of older guys uh, leave and so. We knew it was going to be a relatively young team, so Coach uh, did a great job bringing guys like Tristan, Haas, uh, other transfers in, uh, VC senior leadership. Uh, I mean, Tristan brings so much to his team on and off the court. Uh, he's a great guy and a great great basketball player. So, Yeah, I mean, you know, I was around the program last year, you know, watching practice and games and stuff, um, you know, but you know, over the off season and the summer, you know, when Coach was bringing in these transfer, transfer guys, you know, we all just started to bond together well, and you know, like people like Tristan, Haas, Joey, um, you know, all the transfers, you know, they all help us out in you know big ways. Um, you know, we got a deep bench because of the transfers, and you know, I feel like that helps us out a lot. Next question on the right side, Kevin. Kevin Sweeney from Sports Illustrated for for Donovan. I'm curious what you've learned this season from going against the Dama in practice. Yeah, I mean, uh, Dama has made me a much better player throughout the whole year. Um, he's so talented on both ends of the floor. Uh, his footwork is, you know, amazing. So trying to, you know, defend him and keep, you know, stay on my feet and stay physical, you know, it's always, it's been a challenge for me all year, but you know, he's, okay. he prepared me for the, you know, Big East play and, you know, he prepared me for the highest level, like, like that we're in now. Um, you know, Adama, all credit to Adama. You know, he's a, he's a heck of a player and, you know, he's definitely helped me improve throughout the year. Just a housekeeping item real quick. Joey Calcaterra is available in the locker room. He won't be in the main interview room today. Let's go to that same area, and then we'll come back to Zach. Let's get a microphone. That's the back left microphone. Uh, Michael Cohen from Fox Sports. Uh, Donovan, when it comes to you know Jordan's ability to hit shots, part of that comes from him, and part of it comes from the screens that guys like you and Adama and Alex set. I was wondering if you could describe sort of like the, the choreography that goes into learning the way Jordan wants to play and him learning the way you guys set screens and, and how that's developed over the course of the season. Yeah, um, you know, throughout the season, Jordan just was a knockdown shooter. And, you know, when, when I'm trying to hand the ball off or set a screen, I got to, you know, force the guy to try to go, you know, either under or over and, you know, just make sure I hold my screen just so that he gets as much space as possible to get a shot off, you know, quick. Um, you know, that every guy's going to chase Jordan off of a, you know, a pin down or a ball screen or whatever just because, you know, how lethal of a shooter he is. So, you know, I just got to, you know, coach calls a head hunt and, you know, just got to find the body and screen and, you know, hold my screen. Next question's for Zach, then we'll go to John. For any of the guys, really, what, what has the, been the message you, when Jim Calhoun has met with you guys, 
what's been his message and when you have someone who obviously has been to the top like he has how, how, how much how helpful do you think it is that he's still around the program Tristan's first answer yeah his experience and leadership is is good for us uh, tells us what to expect when we get to this these positions and his message is really go out there and do what we got to do to win a game and that's pretty much uh, the main point of it Jordan anything to add um, I mean he's the GOAT uh, so when he talks you definitely listen um, he just gives us great advice before the Sweet 16 and the Elite 8. He gave us great advice when we came down here. And we always going to have that in our back pot, or back of our heads. So. Donald? Yeah, I mean, you know, like Jordan said, he's the GOAT. Um, you know, he, he's been in this position multiple times. So, you know, hearing, hearing from his perspective, you know, is important to us and, you know, helps us get, get us ready for, you know, this weekend. We'll take the next question from the front on the left side, John. John Phantom with Fox Sports. Jordan, thinking about this this ride, um, I think back to your season opener when when you unfortunately had to exit the game. I know it was it was tough. Um, like, how would you describe the process of of hearing about or saying to yourself, "This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen at UConn," and having to get through the hurdles of stuff like that, and now it is happening. Um. I mean, it was definitely a little tough stretch because I ended the season on the concussion, season over, uh, sophomore year. Expected big things to happen for me. Uh, just got hit with another concussion. But, um, I mean, just having support system around you is the biggest thing. I, I, I just give all credit to them. They just kept me confident. I mean, I was really at a low, low time, a uh, really tough place. But they just got to work out of it. I mean, I got great people around me, um, all credit to them. So, I, without them, I, I don't think I'd be in this position. So. Continuing with questions for Tristan, Donovan, or Joey, if there are any. We'll go back to John Fanta, front left. This is for any of the guys. Um, you, you come off as this group that's just got the depth, the well-rounded nature, uh, that there's not just one leader, like a clear leader, that's coming from different sources. Can you reflect on how that's been built out with this group that – culture of unselfishness and that, that guys are sort of given for the entire whole? Um, I mean, after the season ended uh, last year and we knew the coach was going to go to the portal, um, we, we, me and Dre and Adama took in like really personal to build a relationship with the guys. Uh, every day hang out with them during the summer. I mean, there is nobody else on campus. It's just us. So. Every single day we would hang out with each other, uh, do something together. Um, during the finals, uh, we all got, got together, got some food. Um, just building that little connection on and off the court. We shoot together, uh, just do all those little things together. Just build that chemistry up, uh, just learn how we how each other play, so, yeah. Donovan, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a bunch of leaders on this team. Um, you know, Dre, Adama, Jordan, you know, the senior older guys, they all, they're all great leaders. and. You know, they help build this team, you know, to have a great connection like we do now. Um, you know, it's just a great group of guys to play with. Let's go back toward the center left lane. This one's a little off the wall for any of you, but every other team in this year's Final Four happens to be a lot closer to the beach than Storrs, Connecticut. Is that something that, you know, makes you guys jealous, or do you wish there was better weather where you guys play? Tristan, you guys make it to the beach from campus? Um, <laughs> I don't even think there's a beach in Connecticut. Is there? Yeah, there's a beach. Oh, yeah, I've never Lakes seen it. Up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've never seen it. Um, I haven't been to the beach much. It's a little. I'm a little jealous. So I'll say that. Yeah. Any further questions for UConn? Yes, we do have one. Michael Cohen from Fox Sports. Uh, Jordan, when it comes to shooting, have you always had the confidence that you have now, or was that something that built, you know, over time throughout your career in just the idea that no matter when you let it fly, it's going to go? Um, I think I've been had it since since I was a kid. Um, I, mean, I just put so much hard work in it, so, so many reps. So, I mean, once you do that, you just have to be confident in it. You know, just know you're doing the right thing. Um, just know sticking to it. So uh, I just had this confidence since I was a – so I was in middle school, high school, I'm just keeping that confidence that I was a jump shooter. So. Any additional questions for these student athletes from UConn? All right, with no more questions, we'd like to thank Tristan and Jordan and Donovan.
for joining us here in the main interview room. They're going to head and do the radio interviews. We're going to get some of their teammates up here as well. Once again, Joey Calcaterra will not be one of them. He's going to be available in the UConn locker room. The UConn locker room remains open for student athlete interviews. Those student athletes and these guys' teammates who are not joining us here in the main interview room, but we are joined now by Alex Caravan, Andre Jackson Jr., and Adama Sinogo. If you have questions for Adama, Andre, or Alex, please raise your hand, and one of our microphone handlers will make their way toward you. Please state your name and media outlet before your question. Any questions? Who's got the first one? Let's go up front to the left. Uh, Dom Amori from the Hartford Current. Uh, Andre, uh, I know you, you've watched and you've thought about the Final Four and dreamed about it, but now that you're here, uh, the last week, is the hype and the attention and all of the things that go around it, you know, being driven in a golf cart to a press conference, for instance, are those things maybe above and beyond even what you imagined it would be? Yeah, definitely. I always just thought about playing the game, so... It wasn't so much about all the other stuff, but to be around all the different t uh, types of things that they do surrounding the Final Four is definitely something I never really imagined. So it's a great opportunity. Continuing with questions, let's do one on the left side of the aisle. Uh, right, Dan Daniel Gutierrez, KTRU here in Houston. When I, for each of you, and I don't know which order you want to do, when, when I say Houston, Texas, what's the first thing you thought of, obviously before the Final Four? The order we'd like to go in is Adama, Andre, Alex. Shit, uh, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> phone wasn't up yet. Don't worry about it. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, I, I, actually, I was thinking about the food. I, I'm not like they have good steak here. Yeah, they have good steak. Here. I was definitely thinking about the food. Yeah. Right. I, would, I would say music, like <laughs> Houston, and Vegas, or like uh, Travis Scott. I thought of James Harden right away when he was killing with the Rockets. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Let's go toward the back of the room, left side. 
Uh, yeah, for Alex, I was just curious how important the, the red shirt season was for you. It seems like there's hardly any freshmen in this Final Four playing a ton of minutes. You and Donovan are, are among the only two. How important was that, that oh, year for you? It was the most important decision I made. I think it allowed me to get over those freshman hurdles right away, and it allowed me to practice against veteran forwards like Isaiah, Tyrese, and Tyler from last year's team. So I got better from playing against them every day, and then – I also learned how Coach really operated, what offense he wanted, what defense he likes to play, and um, the strength program really helped me get adjusted really quickly to the next level. So if it wasn't for me coming early, I don't think I'd be playing this many minutes. We're going to move to the right side of the room. Chris? Uh, Chris Button with ESPN. This is for Adama. As you um, celebrated and uh, observe uh, you know, the fasting this week, to play at the elite level that you do, can you take me through your process and the difficulties and with the tip time as it is on Saturday, what you'll do before tip? Yeah, uh, it's definitely hard, you know, because like, uh, like you said, you know, it's my fifth and this is something that I, I didn't start doing this year. I've been doing this like since I was in high school. I used to do it during like uh, AU, you know, but you know, like it's definitely hard because like 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 last uh, last game against Gonzaga, I was like a little bit tired because of, like you know I was tasty. You know, like you said, uh, but uh, the good thing is well, um, Saturday game is the the game is at 7:49, and uh, I think I will be able to I will be able to eat at 7:40. So that's like eight minutes before the game. So I think I should be fine for the game for sure. Yeah, yeah. So the right of the aisle, midway back, Zach. Zach Brazil in your post. Adamo. How much help? How how good is it for you and for to to have someone like Donovan to to practice against all year? He talked a little bit about going up against you. Yeah. How much do you think that's helped you though, with having him there? Yeah, I mean Donovan like in a team definitely helped me, and I think he definitely helped the team. But by, I think he definitely helped me personally because it makes me ready for go against him every day in practice. It makes me ready for like uh, other guys, like uh, other big men, other seven footer in a conference that I play. So, you know, and this is a guy like, you know, like uh, I thought coming to like, they, there's a lot of freshmen when they're first year, you know, they don't, they're not, they're not about it. They don't give up in practice. They don't want to practice. But Donovan, you know, like every practice, like he bring it to you. You know, you want to fight, you know, you want to like, you want your spot. So that's something that I really like from him. So it was definitely good, like playing against him. And the thing is like, it, it helped me a lot. As a, it, helped, it helped us a lot as a team too, because last year I was playing 30, 35 minutes a game. By the end of the season, I was already tired, you know. But this year, I was playing like I'm playing 25 to 26 because it's coming to like play some time away from me. So it was definitely like helpful to have him in the team this year. Yeah. You're at the back of the room, left side. Uh, Michael Cohen from Fox Sports for any of you guys. I, I know it doesn't necessarily show up in the stat sheet when you set a great screen and then Jordan hits a three off of that, but. What does that feel like, and, and does the coaching staff track it, or, or how much pride do you guys take in knowing that the role that you play creates some of his open shots? Andre? Yeah, I think we all know that, and we know the significance of that. Just doing all the little things right is something that everybody reiterates to us, and we just talked to Rip earlier. He said stuff like that, just setting a good screen, even if the play is not for you. That's what builds championship programs. So we all know what it takes to win, and we know that it's not always about the glory or who gets the point or – Whatever, it's always about just us scoring as a team, and we all know that. Alex, see you nodding your head. Did you have something to add? No, yeah, I agree with Andre, and um, I definitely love doing it for Hawk, too, because he's such a great shooter, and when we set those screens and he starts getting hot, it's something special, even watching as a teammate, playing with him, and um, it just makes us a thousand times better when he's getting him going. Continuing with questions for Alex, Andre, and Adama, if there are any. If you have a question, raise your hand. Let's go back to Zach. Zach Brazil, near post. Damas, you said you you'll be able to eat eight minutes before the game on Saturday. Yeah. What what can you eat so close to playing? I just need my coconut water. If I have my coconut water and one uh, orange juice, I think I'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> how how challenging is it though to to have to balance it? Uh, I feel like uh, it's it's definitely hard. It's hard, but I feel like the more you're thinking about it, the more it become harder. You know what I mean? So like that's why I'm trying to like just do it, not thinking about it too much. You know. Because I like, I like last eight here, I've been doing it. So, yeah, you know, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't seem to, it, I mean, it hasn't seemed to affect you at all during the tournament. Yeah. Why is that? Yeah, like I said, I'm used to it, you know. I, like last, last eight here, I've been doing it, you know. And I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking about it. Uh, I'm not thinking about it too much. Because I feel like the more you're thinking about it too much, the more you're going 
you know, you're gonna, you're gonna be like, you're gonna be hard for you to do it. That's why, like, I just wake up, you know, and I do it, you know, and I stay for, you know, yeah, I'm not trying to think about it a lot, you know, yeah, no, no. We have just a few more minutes for questions if there are any. <clears throat> Let's go back to Lane. Yeah, Adama, just to follow up on that a little bit, you know, what do you have as your, are you allowed to eat anything before the sun is up? And do you just have like a massive meal then? And like, are you stuffing your face at halftime? Like, yeah. how do you handle, you know, refueling and adding enough calories to function? Uh, so like, uh, I will be able to eat after the sun goes down at 7.40. So from that to like 5 a.m. to the next morning, I eat like, uh, I, like I eat like a lot of food like, with the protein, you know, like some, like uh, uh, my strength coach, he makes sure I eat like a lot, like I drink a lot, uh, I hydrate, you know, so like I hydrate a lot. In, uh, so, uh, for example, I wake up at five, uh, like drink a lot of food and drink a lot of water, so make sure like during that day, I stay hydrated, yeah. So that's what, that's, that's what we're doing right now. Wake up at 5 a.m., drink a lot of uh, coconut water, and uh, so make sure I stay hydrated during the day. Yeah, so that's our plan right now, yeah. We got a question on the left side. Alex, your assists are really up in the last 10 or 15 games, over two per game. Is that a conscious decision, something the coach has told you about, or just you becoming more comfortable now with the offense, knowing what your teammates are going to be? Yeah, I think it's just being more comfortable with the offense. I think the coach has always gave me the freedom to attack and um, make the right reads. I think I just got more comfortable out there on the court, being aggressive at times, and um, just getting used to the college experience of reading defenses better to where I could find my open teammates easier than just credit to them for making the shots. We have another question, Kevin. Yeah, for Andre, it's Kevin Sweeney for Sports Illustrated. Um, I saw a stat earlier that 27 of your 31 assists in this tournament have led to a dunk or a three. What does that say about the, the shots that you're creating when, when you're distributing the ball? I would just say that well, a lot of times when I make plays, it's in, it's in transition, and a lot of guys run the floor well. We got some athletes; they get out in transition and get some dunks with a dama. And I really like to pass it to the three-point shooters because you know what I mean. That gives it a lot of the team a lot of momentum, and that's kind of the strength of a lot of the players I'm playing with. So that's something that I just like to do is, is get guys like shots close to the rim and threes. Is there a final question for any of our UConn student athletes? With no more questions, we'd like to thank Alex, Andre, and Adama for joining us here in the main interview room. See some of you guys tomorrow. <laughs> UConn head coach Dan Hurley will be here in the main interview room from 3.20 until 3.40. The UConn locker room is probably closing about right now. See you back in about 20 minutes.
In just a moment, we'll be joined by UConn head coach Dan Hurley. Coach Hurley will be here for a 20-minute period, 3.20 to 3.40. We may be able to start a little sooner than that. If you're joining us in the main interview room, please take this opportunity to silence your cell phone. A reminder, no flash photography here in the main interview room, no video recording, no streaming. Do not use your camera phone or your cell phone to record video or stream. ASAP transcripts will be available immediately following the press conference, and video will be available at ncaa.veritone.com. Coach Hurley has arrived. We'll ask Coach Hurley to open things up with a statement, and then he'll take questions. Go ahead, Coach. Yeah, obviously, uh, really excited to be here, exhilarating uh, the reception here in the uh, the great state, uh, the great state of Texas, but the great city of Houston. Uh, just feel so welcome um, you know, by the people. It's great to get um, get on the stadium today and and get on the court and and, and put the work in, prepared for. Uh, our biggest challenge of the, of the season, this Miami uh, team, it's playing great. Coach, we're going to open things up with two questions on the left side. This is the front left microphone, and Zach will begin. Uh, Zach Brazil New York Post. Uh, what's up, Dan? What's up, Zach? Um, Isaiah Wong said he nearly committed to you, or not nearly, but you guys were very involved. With oh, him. He so he, did he say he almost committed? Because that's a heartbreaker. <laughs> I thought we were a distant second, but... Um, what, what do you remember about recruiting him, and did you feel like you guys had a good shot to get him? I think you get a sense on the visit whether you're, you know, whether you're going to get the gold or the silver. Um, I think we, we always felt like we were a little bit behind, but we, um, you know, we imagined the potential backcourt of him and Book Knight, uh, and it was obviously the, it was an exciting dream that didn't come to fruition. Um, just loved him as a player. He. Uh, you know, Jersey guard, um, you know, athletic and, you know, could, could score, can play make, you know, a heck of a defensive player. It's not surprising that, um, you know, that, that he's, you know, he's led his team to this point and you know, he's eventually going to have a long career in the NBA. Coach, in that same area, let's go up a row. Okay, we can take that one also. We'll take that one first, then Adam after that. I'm good to go. Dan, Jonathan Alexander, Houston Chronicle. What's up? Um, thanks for doing this. Uh, some of your players were talking about, uh, you know, the reason why they think they've been good throughout this tournament is because of the depth they had. How important was that you in, in, in crafting this team and, and building this team throughout the season? And, and, and when did you feel like it really became a strong suit for you guys? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Jonathan, uh, last year, the lack of depth uh, caught up to us in the Big East tournament and in the NCAA tournament, our bench, was really short last year, and um, I just think you know coming out of that loss to New Mexico State, you know we understand that, you know, or I understood that the best teams I've coached in college were, were eight, nine, even ten, ten deep with quality, um, because of how hard we play. You've got to have a deep team, and felt like last year's team gassed out. Um, you know, and yeah, the depth. We're, we're, uh, we're able to play in a pretty relentless fashion defensively on the backboard um, and then attacking you offensively because we were able to keep people fresh. I think Adama Sonogo has you know, been, one, you know, been one of the best players in the NCAA tournament in large part because we've been able to keep him fresh this year. Last year, this time of year, he was, he was playing 34, 35 minutes a game as a big guy. This year, Donovan Klingon being able to keep him fresh has been a, a big reason why he's been able to dominate and that we're still playing. Third row, right side, Adam Zagoria. I did not raise my hand, but not this time. I, now I feel like and you I'm didn't get it to Davidson, did you? No, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, my, my daughter verbally committed for pole vault to Davidson. Thanks for asking. Oh, hey, congrats to her. Um, I didn't raise my hand, but Andre Andre Johnson's a walk on. He's got a NIL deal. He told me with degree. Yeah. Just uh, what does it mean that even like a walk on can get an NIL deal and you know, what does that say about uh, opportunities for everybody with NIL? Yeah, I mean, listen, he works hard. You know, walk-ons, you know, it's, it's not real glamorous. I know, you know, you, you know they are, they're practice, practice dummies, and, um, you know, they rarely get a chance to play, and, you know, it's all about how they help your team to prepare. Um, you know, and we goof on him. I mean, I goofed on him today. He, did, he screwed up a couple drills, and I started, you know, 
making fun of him about that because my wife walked out this morning on the street and saw him on like a, a, a video advertisement. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's great for him. I, he's a great kid. And, and it was just strange that she saw him in an ad this morning on her walk. Second row on the aisle. Second row, please. Dan. Dan Walken, USA Today. Uh, Dan, I know, like everybody in your profession, you were aware of the NIL activities going on around Miami a year ago. It was very highly public. Just at, at the time, what did you make of that? I mean, was it the kind of thing where, you know, as a coach, you're looking at that going, you know, boy, this, this is going to be interesting to see how, how it plays out when it's this public? Yeah, I think um, it was a real shock, I think, to the system because it, NIL – I just know, I just consciously during the course of our season and like we're pretty locked into the coaching piece, but you know, it's almost like the NIL during last season was like still like, like a, I don't want to say like a, a rumor or, you know, and then that hit you like, uh, that sent shockwaves I think when, when, when we saw that and how it was playing out publicly. Um, you know, it's obviously, it's, it's where things are headed. Um, you know, these uh, incredible athletes, you know, deserve everything that they can get and I think obviously you know the coach and their staff did a heck of a job like you know um, you know with this team because I know that there was like a lot of that like public stuff I think when the when Pat got the money and then the, you know I think some of the other guys were you know where, where's mine and you know that's like some high level leadership and coaching to be able to have this team in that position while some of that stuff was kind of the first big NIL stuff that was going on. Front row left, Dom. Yeah, Dom and Maury Hartford Current. Yeah. I know very often coaches going through the Super Bowl for the first time are kind of overwhelmed by the whole scene and everything that goes around it. Uh, what's been you know, your take on that? Has any part of this really kind of blown you away or where you said, wow, I didn't know that's what it would be like? Yeah, I mean, all of my great mentors tried to get me ready for this, Coach Calhoun and, and, and Gino and, and um, uh, Tom Izzo and, and you know, Coach K and, and, uh, and Jay Wright, like I was smart enough to try to get some the great advice from people of what to expect. You don't expect the, the, a lot of the media demands um, and just the feeling of exhilaration and, and that just how big this is. I think I've said to Kamani and, and Luke and Tom, like, hey, this is kind of a big deal, huh? And it, it's different than you expect. I'm just happy that I kind of changed my sleep schedule. I got to bed earlier and I got myself up super early so I, could, so I could consume the 10 to 12 of the Miami games I needed to consume so that I have my team ready to play on Saturday night because this is a lot. Coach, we're going to stay up front in the center. First row, front row. Gavin Keith from London Day, just kind of going off of that, what's enabled your team to, to stay kind of so calm in such a, a big situation? It's automatic this time of year. I mean, you, you um, every player knows what to do. They understand your style of play. They understand, like, your... You know, your tactics on offense and defense, obviously you're tailoring it to your opponent and how you want to attack them at both ends of the court. Everyone knows their role. Um, you know, so everything kind of this, this time of year is automatic. You know, as a coach, how you're going to call the game. Uh, it, for me, it's just I'm trying to keep these guys in that balance between like the edge that you need to have as a team so that you don't get complacent, but not making them uptight and nervous, keeping that confidence. That, that's like that, that balance that all these great coaches have kind of talked to me about. Um, you know, don't allow your team to be happy to be here, but they deserve to feel good about it because it's, it's really hard to get here. Coach, right side toward the back. Jeff, we're going to use the back right microphone. Jeff Goodman. Uh, Dan, how important was it uh, when you guys went from the American to the Big East, and, and do you feel like you would have been here had you stayed in the American? That's that's number one. Number two, uh, I talked to Andrew Hurley earlier. And, uh, <laughs> Andrew or Andrew? And, and, well, both. Yeah. Both, but I won't say what Andrea said about you, but Andrew <laughs> described you when I asked him to, to one word describe you. Bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Any Any response to that? To the second part? Sure, let's start there. Yeah, he's a chip off the old block, so <laughs> he's just a mini me. Um, both my boys are. Uh, yeah, and then the first part, listen, I, I we would we would still be here. Um, 
it's been a great relationship for both of us. We've obviously brought a ton to the Big East. The Big East is, has been unbelievable for UConn. It's, it's, a, it's a great partnership. I think we're great for every team in the league. I think, you know, having big brand programs, you know, that, that are playing at a high level, it only enhances everyone's opportunity in the league. And obviously at St. John's and Georgetown and the pro all those moves in our league, I think it's great for everybody. Um, and, and, you know, again, like we recruited James Booknight and R.J. Cole and Tyrese Martin uh, and, and a cook. And um, we started kind of putting this thing together. And none of those players, uh, you know, they, they knew nothing about the Big East. So I think, you know, quality people in the UConn brand, I think, you know, still would have been able to attract good enough players for us to get here. But it's it certainly the relationship's been I think really beneficial for both parties. It's not one-sided in, in either way. Back left, John Fanta. Dan, John Fanta with Fox Sports. What's up, John? Uh, um, you've talked a lot about the UConn standard. Take us back down memory road of when you took this job, when you thought about what success looks like in stores and how it compares to tasting the reality of it now. Yeah, it's, um, you know, you, you don't go from Rhode Island to a place like UConn unless you have, some, like, uh, you know, high-level internal motivation uh, to be challenged at the absolute highest level of a co as a coach and as a player because you, you're going to be graded against, you know, the greatest coaches and the greatest players to play college basketball in the last 25 years. So... You know, you've got to be. You got to have the stomach to handle that. You've got to ha have the toughness, uh, the self belief, as players and coaches, uh, to want to put yourself in a situation where, where, if you're not getting the Final Fours and you're not competing at the top of the Big East, that that you're failing. Um, it's a lot easier to coach or play at places where um, making the tournament is enough. Um, you know, but I, I, I'm. I'm you know, for me, when you grow up in, in the, the, the way I grew up, you know, you, you want to go and challenge yourself all the time. Same area as Zach. Zach Braziller, New York Post. Dan, what is, what is having Jim Calhoun around meant, meant for you? You know, he said he, you brought him around a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he talked about he thinks the best thing you've done is how you've navigated tough situ tough stuff stretches hmm. what's been the biggest kind of help for you as he been um you know just great advice i met with coach before the season and you know he talked about the importance of you know some basketball type of things like transition offense and um but, but i think it was it was uh, more like like leadership and um and uh you know having him come to practice and you know, kind of tell me things that he that he liked, and then uh, I think also like he spends a, he spent a lot of time talking with our players. Like when practices are over, he's grabbing Andre Jackson, Adama Sinogo, and he watches every game. I mean, he lives and dies with all of our games. So um, you know, he's just you know, him and Gino are you know, they are UConn basketball. Um, so just to have those two guys around, obviously. It's hard for me to meet with them together. <laughs> but I get a lot of time with them separately. I hope to get a picture with the both of them. So coach is coming out, I think, tonight. So I know that will go viral if I can get those two guys together. In the center of the room, coach. Hey, coach. The front left, Matt. Yeah, I think Miami reminds me a little bit of Marquette, a um, little bit of like Arkansas in terms of like athleticism on the perimeter, like length, size, you know, some of the kind of the pace offensively that Marquette could put on you and the pressure they put on you off the dribble. Um, and then what's, you know, what's probably the, the thing that stands out is the only game that they've lost, you know, recently, um, you know, besides, I guess, that Florida State game, which is just one of those games you played during the year that's just kind of, inexplicable we had one of those um as well this year was 
you know, they would not have lost uh, in, in a while if maybe Omir doesn't sprain his ankle in that Duke game. And they still were in position, you know, to, to win that game and maybe win the ACC championship while losing maybe the most physical, def you know, rebounder in the country. So, uh, you know, they stress your one-on-one -on -one defense. You know, they got multiple guys I think are NBA players. I think Miller's one of the most underrated players in the country. A lot, you know, it's hard to say Isaiah Wong is. He's player of the year in the ACC. But, you know, they're, they're, uh, it's going to be the hardest game of the year. We know that. Um, and uh, we're excited to play against somebody that's that good. All the way up front, all the way left. Dave Borges, First Connecticut Media. Dan, uh, seeing Jalen Gaffney here um, here this week as well. I don't know if you had a chance to see him yet, but um, happy for the way things have worked out for him. Uh, you know, worked out for both parties, really. Yeah, thrilled for thrilled for Jalen, thrilled for his family. Um, you know that it's played out so great, and that he's he's had such a successful season. And uh, you know, I, I'm just uh, I have a lot of appreciation and. and and, and gratitude towards Jalen because just like, you know, the Book Knights and the Isaiah Whaley's and the Tyler Polly's and the Cooker Cooks and everyone, that, Christian Vital and Jalen Adams, like, he's a huge reason why we're here as a program. He helped us, you know, build the culture and begin to have success. And, you know, J Jalen, uh, I'll always be grateful to him for what he's, he's another reason why we're here. So the right of the aisle, Coach Lane. Hey, Coach. Lane Higgins from the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, last season you had every single upperclassman on your team either exhaust their NCAA eligibility or transfer out. And, you know, in a different age of college sports, that might totally crater a team. But, you know, you're able to bounce back and rebuild and be in this spot. Like, how, you know, how did you approach that situation when you realized that all of a sudden you were going to be really young, really fast? Well, we knew that we had um, a big three in, in Andre Jackson, Jordan Hawkins, and Adama Sinogo. Like, you know, we, we knew the big sophomore jump was coming for Hawk. Um, you, you, we, we knew that if we could get another, you know, perimeter starter like a Tristan Newton that could shoot and score, and, and a four-man like Caravan, and then obviously adding Donovan to Adama, that it would unlock, you know, Andre's playmaking, facilitating. Um, so we knew we had a big three. We knew we had two blue-chip freshmen. Uh, so we knew going into the portal we needed – you know, specific things, especially perimeter shooting, and then older players. And you know, we liked, you know, like Naheem Aleen, you know, we, we were desperate to get Naheem because of his success in the NCAA tournament uh, at Virginia Tech, particularly in the Florida game. I think he had 29. Um, and we had struggled the year before, so obviously that was appealing to ha bring somebody into a program that had struggled the year before, a confident March player. Um, yeah, obviously, Joey, Joey California. You know, um, you know, and then a, and then a bulldog backup guard in, in Hassan Diara. So, you know, we had a vision for how we could put it together, but we knew the big three would deliver. Coach, we're going to go to the right side, left of the aisle. Mike? Yeah, Mike DeCourcy with the Sporting News. What's Dan, up, Mike? congratulations. Thanks, Mike. Um, I wanted to ask you about, I mean, beginning of the year, you come out and you guys are one of the best teams in the country, beat Alabama, win 14 in a row. And now you're here, so obviously one of the best teams in the country. Then there was January. What happened in that month that uh, that sort of uh, diverged from the rest of the season? And does it have help? Does it help you to have gone through that? Yeah, it's funny. Like I add to the, this answer, like you just get better at answering it, right? Because a lot of things happened. Where our defense tanked. We went from an elite defensive team. We didn't guard anybody for two weeks, uh, so we got soft. We got away from our identity. Uh, I think part of it was like the Big East got us. I mean, our top four or five in the Big East this year when Providence, you know, before Providence kind of struggled late, like our top five was better than any other conference's top five, especially our top four. If Fremantle doesn't get hurt, I mean, you know, Xavier was a much different team when we played Xavier with Fremantle. So they easily could have been a Final Four team with him. Um, so that happened to us. Uh, I started fighting with the refs. Um, and it distracted me from coaching, and it had a negative effect on the team. Um, that went on for, you know, I was on the phone with the head of officials more than I was watching film, and it was just, it was a mistake. And um, so it was multiple things went on. But I wouldn't underestimate just scheduling getting us. When you go to Xavier, and then you go to Providence, and then your breather is Creighton at home, who I think had swept us since we had been in the league, 
and then now your next game is then at Marquette. I mean, it's easy to get in a bad way, um, but I think it's just those it multiple things. But we burned, I mean, we burned that. We, we didn't actually burn it, but like we left that behind in November, December, February, March. We've been as good as anybody. Coach, second row. Uh, Adam Betts with the Journal Acquirer. Coach, a couple answers ago you mentioned uh, Donovan. Can you just speak on how he's been able to, you know, take in this tournament without even really missing a beat? He's, his production has kind of been where it's been all year. Yeah, you you realize how important, especially, and I, I think it, um, you know, being successful in this tournament helps you to identify, like, those traits that are so important to a team that sometimes you don't evaluate recruiting. But, like, you know, people with, with, with pop and, and personality – and, and like that, that guy is alive. I mean, he changes your locker room. He changes your huddle, huddles. He changes your bench when things are going well or poorly. Obviously, the challenge for Donovan as a player was, you know, he was in the two nineties uh, in terms of his weight at the high school level, and you know, just getting him down to two fifty five. Uh, obviously, he's put him in position where he could move well enough to take advantage of his amazing skill set as a player: his hands, his feet, his feel. Uh, but really, you learn a lot about like how important personality is in your program, and he's like he's just you know we got a lot of guys vying to be everyone's favorite teammate, but he's one of them. Left of the aisle toward the back. Uh, Brennan Quinn with the Athletic. Um, Dan, you know you talked the last game about how emotional you were um, pre-game and, and things like that, and it was the possibility of coaching them for the last time. Um, I wonder how you feel about that kind of half hour leading up to Saturday night and both yourself and your guys kind of handling the moment, the enormity of it, playing on that stage and just all that goes into that. Yeah, I, I think um, you know, the good thing about, like, I guess this week is that you are so busy doing stuff that maybe there's less time to you know, think about the moment. Um, obviously, we've, the first couple of days were chaotic. But it's been a lot more normal for us in terms of meeting multiple times a day, you know, getting our multiple uh, practices in on the court. Um, and I think it's just you got to be stone cold as you can about this situation. And I think all all four teams are trying to do the same thing. It's like, you know, hey fellas, this is the this is a four team event, um, you know, that we're trying to win. You know, it's us, Miami, San Diego State, FAU. And the winner of this four-team tournament that's going to go on over the course of, you know, uh, whatever, 48 hours is going to win a national championship. And that it's the team that plays best and closest to their identity is going to walk away with it. That you don't necessarily got to rise to the moment. Um, just, just be at the absolute best of our identity. Um, you know, and I, I think you got to be stone cold about it, though. Left but side, I will cry. Side. I'll be I'll intermittently when the players are not around, uh, Brendan. It, it, I, I mostly just cry around Luke and Kamani and my wife and then just my family. The players, I think Andre Jackson's probably see, saw me um, prior to the Gonzaga game while I was writing, like, game keys and game goals. He saw me sniffling. <laughs> he saw the tissues come out because I just looked at him and it just made me – the guy's just so awesome to coach and be around Left side, left of the aisle, and then we got two more for the beat guys up front, and then we're wrapping. Uh, yeah, Dan, David Cobb from CBS Sports. Uh, kind of how do you decide when to use Adama versus when to use Donovan and what separates those guys and make them unique as post players? Yeah, sometimes it's matchups. Um, sometimes it's, you know, guys got it going. Um, yeah, I, 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 um, you know, it, it's feel for the game. Uh, Foul trouble, right? There's all those things that, that, that come into play. And I would just say it, it's when you have a center like Adama that has gotten better in the ball screen game, but, but he's a guy you could throw the ball in the low post to, and the other team has to really seriously think about trapping because he's very hard to guard one on one in the post. Um, you know, and then he's a physical, positional rebounder and defender. And so he takes away your, your team's low post offense because he's, he's hard to score on because he's, he gets such great leverage. And we could bury you with him in the low post um, and then you got to deal with that and then the 7-2 guy comes in who's just a, a ball screen and roll and the 7-2 guy is rolling to the rim and he's a lob threat 
that, that teams can't deal with because of the size. And now, and obviously, it, it gets them to think paint. Now it opens up the three-point line. So I think what makes it work so well, and it's why I tried to study a lot of, like Matt Painter, one of the best coaches in the country when, it, when he had Williams, um, and he had the two-center attack. We really, this summer, tried to go, go to school on you know, what, what some of that great coach was doing, and that was really helpful. Front and center, final question. This is the front right microphone. Gavin Keith, New London Day. Up, Dan, man? how would you describe the personality of the team and are a couple guys on the team who kind of set that personality? Yeah, I just, um, I think we knew it um, last March, just what we needed to look for in terms of how guys, I think, would have the ability to, to handle the pressure moments. So I, I think, um, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a fun group. Uh, they're very, very hardworking, obviously, and very serious about the game. But we got tremendous leadership, like world-class leadership on Andre Jackson uh, in terms of vocal um, and, and by example. Adama, Adama's probably a little bit more by example, but he gives the team tremendous confidence because of how good he is. He's one of the, you know, he's, he's an all-time great big in, in, in UConn's program's history. So, um, and then all these other guys, man, Caravan and Klingon, Hassan Diara, Joey California. Um, it's a great locker room, and I think it just, it just makes you aware moving forward, maybe not always to go for that guy that's a little bit more talented, but you, have, you, know, you want to have locker rooms like this. It allows you to weather the storms during the year, and you're going to have a team that you know, is loose in March rather than uptight. We want to thank Coach Hurley for joining us here in the main interview room. Thank, thank you, Coach. You. Appreciate it, everybody. That's going to wrap things up for the main interview room today. We'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. I didn't see anybody's hand go up on Zoom. I saw there were people there, but...